Okay, Michael. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that uh, Randy's with us, that Ashley's with us. Father, uh, we're thankful for their health and strength and how you've blessed and watched over us. We thank you for how you've provided and met each and every one of our needs throughout the week. We think of Pressy and how she's feeling better, her back, and how you're answering prayer. We've continued to lift Randy up throughout the week, Lord, uh, throughout each and every day, several times a day. We're trusting you, Lord, to, uh, to handle that. It's not a problem for you, healing, Father. And we rejoice each and every time we see you at work and uh, answer to our prayers as well. We think of Teresa, Lord, and uh, the ongoing struggle she's had with multiple uh, health issues. We think of Elijah and uh, the trouble that he's experienced in school and then just the physical injury that he's been suffering and recovering from. We think of Osiris with his dear wife and the three daughters, Father God, and uh, just that you would meet their need, keep them uh, healthy, because the girls have struggled from time to time with some health issues. We pray that you watch over and continue to bless that family, Lord, and encourage them and help them to grow in grace. We think of uh, Jennifer and Isis, Lord, for their health also. They've had some health uh, challenges uh, over the past few years here, especially Isis most, most recently. So we lift them up to you and pray for their healing and your blessing in their life, Father God. Uh, Lord, bless the study today. Draw us near to each other and to you and to just appreciate your, the word of God, Lord, and uh, the renewing of our mind. We praise you and thank you now, Father God. Bless the study. In Jesus' name, we praise you and thank you. And also, I want to lift up Ty, Lord, who's been struggling with his own disability and has asked for prayer as well. And I pray, Lord, that you help him to get on disability, Lord, uh, that uh, he get, get that issue resolved. And also Julius with the honey, that ongoing struggle, Lord, which is just dragging on so long now. Thank you, Father, that you hear us when we pray and that you care about us personally. We thank you now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Can everybody see that? Uh, yeah, and Osiris, I, I switched you over to the host. Can you keep, keep an eye out in case uh, Randy uh, comes in? Yeah, I'll try to look okay. out for him. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to continue I on hear that. in our study um, about the beginning of the church, the body of Christ. And this is going to be the beginning of Church to Body of Christ, part three. So this is part three. Could everybody hear that? Uh, no, we're not hearing anything. Could you hear? Could you hear it before? Yeah, we could. Okay, I paused it. All right. Um, of the series. So if you missed part one or you missed part two. You might want to go back and take a look at them uh, just to kind of get caught up. And the title for this one is going to be The Day of Pentecost. So our objective uh, in this study is going to be to determine based on scripture whether the church, the body of Christ, begin on the day of Pentecost. All right, so just a little quick review of what we talked about uh, in the last study. Um, previously, we discussed the middle wall of partition and we learned the following. The middle wall of partition was formed when God called out Abraham to create a nation, the nation Israel, through his seed, Isaac and Jacob. This nation was given promises, land, the law, a priesthood which gave them access to God, prophets, and through whom Jesus Christ came. They are a privileged nation among the Gentiles, separated by God to be used by God to someday bless the rest of the world. And we found that information in Genesis, the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, chapter 15, verse 18, chapter 17, verse 9 through 14, and Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 52. Exodus chapter 11, verse 5 through 7, 
Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5 through 8, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, Romans chapter 2, verse 17 and 20, and chapter 9 in Romans, verse 4 and 5, and also in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Specifically speaking about that verse in Isaiah uh, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, uh, I think this verse kind of sums up the basic principle of uh, the middle wall of partition and what God did with it in regards to Israel. In the, in the verse, um, st- chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it reads, Now will I sing to my beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vines and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wimpress therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. So now in this passage, he talks about that vineyard. That vineyard is the nation Israel. And when he says in the verse that he fenced it, he's talking about putting that wall of partition around it. Okay, so here's just a little like uh, visual uh, graph to kind of give you an idea of this middle wall of partition. And as I mentioned before, I want you to think about this middle wall of partition as being a wall that's around the nation Israel that encloses them. And then outside of that wall surrounding the nation Israel is all these other Gentile nations. And so remember, God separates Israel out and he's going to give them some specific promises and some blessings that are only going to apply to them. And if you're inside that enclosure and you're inside that wall, then you get the blessings. And if you're outside the wall, you don't. You're cut off. So in addition to talking about uh, the nation Israel, uh, we also talked about uh, the church, the body of Christ, and who the church, the body of Christ is. And we looked at some scripture to kind of get a definition of that because it's important to make a distinction between the nation Israel, who's God's vehicle or called out group that he's going to use to establish his dominion on the earth, and the church, the body of Christ, which is the group um, that God's going to use to establish his authority in the heavens. So uh, the church, the body of Christ, is made up of Jew and Gentile without distinction. It's known as the one new man. And during this time, when he is building that group, the middle wall partition is down. And Israel has no spiritual privileges over the Gentiles. And that's noted in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 to 18. Um, but let's also take a look at a, a couple other passages where the church body of Christ is discussed. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 and 13, it reads, For as the body is one and hath many members, all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 to 28. It reads, For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you all one in Christ Jesus. Now, taking a look at that passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 through 18, which is actually a passage that we're going to be uh, in quite a bit, or looking at for quite a while. It says, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, still making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, 
having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off, and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. So the church, the body of Christ, is this one new man made up of Jew and Gentile without distinction. With that said, based on Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 to 18, it is my understanding that you can't build both agencies or add to the number of both agencies at the same time, because in order for Israel to exist as a spiritual entity, the wall must be up so that they have a privilege. In order to grow and build the body of Christ, the wall must be down. So that no privilege exists. Only one agency can be the means of reconciliation by God at a time. Note, both can exist on earth at the same time. And as I will show you in scripture, one group can even, even help and assist the other to carry out God's will. So as we study through the book of Acts, we're going to be looking for the place where the wall is down and that distinction is no longer in place. Once we identify when the wall is down, we know God's actually building the church, the body of Christ. Okay, so the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> so let's take a look um, at Acts chapter two, verse one through four. Um, and this is uh, when the day of Pentecost uh, is mentioned. Um, it says, starting in verse one, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts chapter two, verse one through four. So as we move through the book of Acts, that transition book between God's prophesied program through Israel and his mystery program through the body of Christ, the first big event we come to is the day of Pentecost. Now, traditionally, most uh, dispensational Bible teachers and most Bible teachers don't even understand anything about right division or dispensationalism will mark this event as the start of the church, the body of Christ. But based on what we have learned from Ephesians chapter 2, 13 to 18, we're going to study through the scriptures to see if this event, if the events of the dead Pentecost are God working through Israel, according to his prophesied program, and the middle wall of partition is up, or is he carrying out his mystery program through the church, the body of Christ, and the middle wall of partition is down. Okay, so verse one, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Right here in verse one, we are told that this is the day of Pentecost. What is Pentecost? Well, the day of Pentecost is one of the holy days given to Israel under the law. Now remember, the law was given by God as one of those advantages that separated Israel from the Gentiles when the wall of partition was set up. Uh, see Deuteronomy chapter four, verse five through eight, uh, and Romans chapter 2, verse 17 to 20, and Romans chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, for confirmation on that. So Israel, they had this calendar of feast days, seven to be exact, that marked their redemption and what God was going to do for Israel. So let's take a look at some passages in the book of Leviticus to understand what the day of Pentecost is, and also kind of get like a little, quick little understanding of these um, feast days. We're not going to go into great detail about them, but we're just going to kind of just touch on them just a little bit, just so you can have just a little bit of context of where the day of Pentecost fits in with these feast days and, you know, and what they're all about. So we're in Leviticus, we're in Leviticus chapter 23, and uh, we're going to start in verse 5. So Leviticus chapter 23, starting in verse 5, it's going to be verse 5 and 6. It reads, In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month 
is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5 and 6. So we have the first two feast days here in verse 5 and 6. These take place on the 14th and the 15th day of the first month in the spring. They are the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then as you move down the chapter to verse 11, looking at Leviticus chapter 11, um, I mean chapter 23, verse 11 and verse 12, same chapter, chapter 23, but now in verse 11, verse 12. In verse 11 it reads, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And ye shall offer that day when ye weave the sheaf and the, and the he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Here in verse 11 and 12, you have the first fruits. So there's the Passover, the feast of unleavened bread, then the first fruits. These are the first uh, three in the Jewish calendar. Now, these feasts were required for them to keep under the law every year. But these feasts point to something that was to come. Those first three represent the following. The death, which is the Passover, the burial, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the resurrection, which is the first fruits of the Lord Jesus Christ. So those first three feasts represent the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Israel practiced these feasts throughout their whole, when God gave them to them every year. But what those feasts were pointing to was something that was going to happen in the future. It was actually going to be a real event that fulfilled what that feast that they were practicing was going to represent. And so during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, that generation of people they got to see the fulfillment of some of these things that the law and the prophets said would come and that they were, and that these feasts were pointing to. Now, Pentecost is one of these feast days. Take a look at verse 16. So we're in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. All right, so 50 days, Pentecost is 50 days after the first fruits feast. And just like the previous three feasts find their fulfillment in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is a fulfillment of what that feast pointed to every year when Israel celebrated it. Looking at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 24, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and a holy convocation. So you will notice here in the seventh month around what we call September, they have another feast called the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 27. Also, on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement, it shall be a holy convocation unto, unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Then in verse 27, you have the day of atonement or the feast of atonement on the 10th day of the seventh month. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The 15th day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 34. Then in verse 34, the 15th day of the seventh month is the Feast of Tabernacles. There's a little chart I pulled offline, uh, just kind of visually lay out for you um, these feast days and just give you a kind of a an idea, like an overall picture of the flow of them and how it all goes. You have the biblical holidays, the spring holidays, you got the Passover, unleavened bread, first of fruits, 50 days, Pentecost. 
Then you got the fall holidays, trumpets, tabernacles, and days of atonement. And you notice on the bottom of this chart, the person who made this chart says that those first four were historically fulfilled during Jesus Christ's first coming, uh, which they're correct about. And then you'll notice that they throw a little separation in there and they label it the church. Now, I don't know if they understand that there's a parentheses that takes place in between here and not, but what we're going to see here is that something interrupts this program and these other three fulfillments don't happen as soon as they should have happened. But they are to happen and be fulfilled during Jesus Christ's second coming. All right, so the Feast of Trumpets, um, as I mentioned, will find its fulfillment when Jesus Christ gathers in his elect from the four corners of the earth. The Feast of Atonement will be fulfilled when he sets foot back on earth and rids the earth of sin. And finally, the Feast of Tabernacle will be fulfilled when he sets up his kingdom, his kingdom up on earth and abides or tabernacles with men. So those last three feasts are the gathering, the return of Jesus Christ, and the kingdom here on earth. All those things are a fulfillment of the Jewish calendar of redemption. And when you get to Acts chapter 2, it is clear that that event is a Jewish holiday, a Jewish event, and even more so that this time when they're celebrating it, it's, just, it's not like every other year when they celebrated it. It's actually being fulfilled. The fulfillment of what it pointed to is actually happening and is actually taking place. So if all of these feasts, including the feasts taking place in Acts chapter 2, are based on the law that God gave to Israel, the question becomes, is the wall up or is the wall down? Well, obviously the wall is up. The Miller Wall partition is still around the nation Israel. And God is still dealing with Israel based on the law and the feast of that law. Okay, looking back at Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, as I mentioned before, this is not just like every other year that they celebrate the day of Pentecost. This is the actual fulfillment of what that feast day represented. The middle wall of partition is still around the nation of Israel, and God is still dealing with Israel based upon the law and the feast of that law. Remember, Jesus said the following. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 13, he says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And then in Luke chapter 16, verse 16, he says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man passeth into it. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, it reads, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So, we have the law being fulfilled as Jesus Christ said, but note he says law and the prophets. If this is in fact God's prophetic program about Israel and about what's going on inside that middle wall of partition, it is associated with the law being fulfilled, then it should also be associated with prophecy being fulfilled. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2 and starting in verse 14. But Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. For this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on and on my servants, 
and my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, and vapor and sm of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, there before that great and notable day of the Lord come. You'll notice that Peter says, for this is that, for this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Peter's saying, what's happening today, right now, what you're witnessing, is what was prophesied by the prophet Joel. So not only is it a fulfillment of the law and that feast day, is also the fulfillment of a prophecy that was given by the prophet Joel. Now let's look back at Joel chapter 2 and you'll see exactly what was spoken by the prophet Joel. <clears throat> but first, I want you to take notice of who the audience is in Acts chapter 2 and in Joel chapter 2. Okay? So let's first look at this verse in Joel chapter 2. Uh, starting in verse 23, and listen to who the audience is, all right? Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dwelt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Joel chapter two, verse 23. Except in the context of the passage, Joel is speaking to the nation Israel, just like Peter on the day of Pentecost. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. And in Joel chapter 2, he says, be glad then ye children of Zion and rejoice in the Lord your God in verse 23. And my people should never be ashamed, verse 26. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord God and none else and my people in verse 27. So the nation Israel as a spiritual entity exists at this point. They still exist, and God is still working through them and giving word to them. So now when you get to verse 28, this is the actual quote that Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2, starting in Joel um, chapter 2, verse 28. And verse 28 reads, And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 32. Now, the all flesh in that passage that he's going to pour his spirit about on, just because you see that word all, you have to always make sure that you, rep that you recognize the context in which that all includes. And the all in this context, the all flesh, is the nation Israel. And he talks about your sons and your daughters. The prophet that is talking to the nation Israel about their sons and their daughters. So all this prophecy that's being prophesied about God pouring out spirit on 
these people and God giving these people their land and, and doing away with their enemies and things like that. This is all directly pointed towards the nation of Israel, who he made those promises to, who he separated out. He's not talking about the Gentiles' sons or the Gentiles' daughters. He's talking about the nation of Israel, his people. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Notice the deliverance is in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Also notice that it's in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. This, is the rem this remnant is the believing remnant of those people, the nation Israel. Continue on to Joel chapter three. In Joel chapter three, verse one, it says, for behold, in those days, in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Notice, it's the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Verse two in Joel chapter three, I will also gather all nations and I will bring them down into the valley of Jesophat, and I will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now look when he mentions all nations, they are mentioned only as they relate to the nation Israel, my people, and for my heritage, Israel. Joel's prophecy is about something God is going to do for the nation Israel to fulfill his purpose in that nation. And that nation will have a privileged status among those nations around them. The wall is still up and will need to be up for God to fulfill this promise. And if the wall is up, you can't have the one new man made up of Jew and Gentile. Broken down the middle wall of partition, he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. So on the day of Pentecost, you have the law being fulfilled because it's one of those feast days under the law. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 16. And as Peter explained, you have prophecy being fulfilled. Joel's prophecy as well. Joel chapter 23, verse 23 to 32. Now, some might argue that what happened in Acts chapter 2 can't be the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy because not everything that Joel prophesied about came to fruition. In Joel chapter 2, verse 30 to 31, it reads, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood. In Acts chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, it reads, And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood for that great and noble day of the Lord come. So you see Peter there re-quoting what Joel said in his prophecy. Now, the reason why it didn't all come to fulfillment is because something interrupted that program as we continue to study, we'll talk about that. But it must be noted that Peter is not lying when he says that what is taking place is what Joel prophesied about. And Peter's message, just like Joel's message, is to the nation Israel. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2, verse 14. So, again, Peter is addressing ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Now, if you go back up to verse 5 in Acts chapter 2, notice who these men are in Judea, and those that are dwelling in Jerusalem. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem. Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. They're all Jewish people at Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. Ye men of Judea, these are the Jews that already live there. And all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, these are the Jews, devout men from out of every nation under heaven that are visiting Jerusalem and staying there to celebrate the Feast Day of Pentecost. It is one of those feasts that every year, every man that was able had to go and celebrate in the city that God chose. And the city that he chose was Jerusalem. Peter's message on the day of Pentecost is to the nation Israel. And what is happening is a fulfillment of the law 
and prophecy about his promises to them. Two things that God gave Israel to set them apart from the Gentile nations, the law and the prophets. So is the wall up or is the wall down at this point? The wall is up. So the wall is up. And I want you to remember what the position of the Gentiles are during the time when the wall is up. Back in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, again, it says, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by them that which are called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, and having no hope and without God in the world. So that's the position of the Gentiles when the wall is up. And that's the position the Gentiles are still in in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, during the day of Pentecost, Peter is talking to the nation Israel and is presenting a message to them about a prophecy concerning a promise to them. Therefore, the wall must be up for them to exist. There is nothing in Acts chapter 2 at this point to indicate that God is reconciling both Jew and Gentile in one body according to the mystery as mentioned in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 27. In fact, if you move on to Acts chapter 3, Peter goes on to say the following. Addressing Israel again, he says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before is preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive, until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear all things, and whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, and as many have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Peter is saying that what is going on right now is what has been prophesied, spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So it can't be the mystery, my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the Revelation mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. Romans 16, 25. One was prophesied about since the world began. One was kept secret since the world began. The two can't be the same. Okay, lesson review. So in this lesson, we discussed the day of Pentecost, and we learned the following. Pentecost is one of Israel's seven feast holy days commanded by God for them to celebrate under the law of Moses. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5 to 34. The event that the Feast of Pentecost pointed to or represented had its fulfillment in Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. The day of Pentecost is also the subject of prophecy. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Job. Acts 2.14, and also in Joel 2, verses 28 to 32. Both Peter and Joel are speaking to the nation Israel about a prophesied promise God is going to fulfill with the nation Israel. Joel chapter 2, verse 21, verse 23, verse 26 to 28, chapter 3, verse 1, 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 5, verse 14 and 17, Acts chapter 3, verse 21, verse 24, 26. The day of Pentecost is not the start of the church, the body of Christ, because that church is formed by breaking down the middle wall of partition. Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, 13 through 18. The day of Pentecost is a prophesied event that is part of the law of Moses given to the nation of Israel. And for the nation and for the nation Israel, so they must exist as a spiritual entity and the wall must be up. Joel chapter 2, verses 21, uh, verse 23, verse 26 to 28, 
Joel chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 5, 14 and 17, and Acts chapter 3, verse 21, verse 24 and 26. Okay, lesson preview. So next time, uh, we're going to discuss the church multiplied in the book of Acts between chapters 2 and 9. And we're going to determine if that church that's being multiplied is the church, the body of Christ, or is a wall of partition still up during that time and it's a different church. Before we close, as always, we're going to take a look at the gospel. Um, I know that just about everybody that's here on the live uh, session of this it knows the gospel and believes in the saved. But just in case anybody's watching this video on YouTube or a friend is passing on to you and you're not sure how to be saved and you're not sure about the salvation, uh, let's take a look at the gospel of the good news um, as presented in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received and wherein you stand by which also ye are saved, you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So, what do you need to do? You need to just believe what God believes. That is, that when Jesus Christ died, he died to pay for everything that is wrong with you and that what he did is enough. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. God just wants to look down on your heart, on your mind, and see that you are trusting what Christ did and that alone to save you. Christ died for your sins and arose from the grave three days later as proof that he paid the price completely. So now the question is, do you believe that? Will you trust in what Christ did? I pray that you do. Okay, that's it for this week. Okay, excellent study. Uh, Michael will be uh, finishing up uh, this week in Bible study. The, um, the Apostolic Authority of Paul is doing summary of it. So we'll be finishing that up. Yep. And... Uh, you will see what direction we go in uh, next, uh, next after that. Uh, oh, how are you feeling, Randy? So, uh, yeah, not, not, not bad. Day by day. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we're still praying for you. Thank, I know. Thank you for all the prayers. I appreciate that. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, everybody have a, a blessed uh, day. Let me cut the recorder off here. I gave you the power back, Julius. And uh, yep. don't forget.